The Dream of a Ridiculous Man by Fyodor Dostoevsky I am a ridiculous man. They call me mad now. This would be a step up if it was not that I remain just as ridiculous in their eyes as before. But this does not make me angry any more. Now they are all dear to me, even when they laugh at me, and at those times somehow even dearer. I would laugh with them, not at myself, but for love of them, if I did not feel so sad to watch them. Sad because they do not know the truth, and I know the truth. Oh, how heavy a weight it is to know the truth, alone. But they cannot understand that. No, they cannot understand. Before, I used to be very vexed because I seemed ridiculous. Not seemed, but was. I have always been ridiculous, and I have known it almost from the day I was born. I probably knew I was ridiculous when I was seven years old. Then I studied at school and afterwards at the university, and the more I studied, the more I learned that I was ridiculous. So that finally all my university studies went solely to prove and explain to me, the deeper I entered into them, that I was ridiculous. And exactly the same happened in my everyday life as in my studies. Year by year, the same consciousness of the ridiculous figure I cut in all circumstances developed and was strengthened in me. Everyone always laughed at me. But none of them ever knew or guessed that if ever there was a man who knew best of all that I was ridiculous, then that man was myself. And it was just this which hurt me most of all, their not realizing it, though it was my own fault. I was always so proud that I would never for the world admit this to anyone. This pride grew in me year by year, and if ever I had allowed myself to admit to anyone whatsoever that I was ridiculous, I would have blown my brains out with a revolver the same night. How I suffered during my adolescent years from the dread that I should not be able to contain myself and one day would suddenly admit it to my friends. But when I became a young man, despite the fact that I recognized my terrible quality more clearly year by year, for some reason I felt calmer. I say for some reason, because to this day I cannot understand why it was. Perhaps it was because my heart was gradually filled with a terrible depression which arose from a circumstance infinitely above me. That is, I became convinced that in this world nothing matters anywhere. I had suspected this for a long time, but the final conviction came during the last year, somehow suddenly. I suddenly felt that I did not care whether the world existed or whether there was nothing in existence anywhere. I began to perceive and to feel with my whole being that I had nothing before me. At first I kept thinking that still there had been a great deal in the past, but then I realized that there was nothing then either, that it had only seemed so. Gradually I became convinced that there would never be anything. Then I suddenly stopped being angry with people and almost ceased to notice them. Indeed, this became clear in the most trivial accidents. For instance, it would happen that I would bump into people when I walked in the streets, and not from preoccupation. What did I have to occupy me then, for I had completely ceased to think? Nothing mattered. I might have solved problems well, yet I did not solve a single one, many though they were. I did not care any longer, and the problems faded into the distance. And it was after this that I discovered the truth. I discovered the truth last November, and on precisely the 3rd of November, and from that time I can recall every second of my life. It happened on the most gloomy of all gloomy evenings. I was returning home towards 11 o'clock at night, and I remember thinking there could be no gloomier time, even from the material point of view. It had been raining all day, a cold, gloomy rain, which seemed, I remember, menacing and manifestly malignant to man, when suddenly, towards eleven, it stopped, and a terrible dampness set in. It grew damper and colder than when it was raining, and everything gave off a kind of steam. Each stone in the street and every muse, if you gaze deep into its depths from the road. I suddenly felt that it would be a consolation if the gas went out everywhere, because with it one felt much sadder as the gas was illuminating it all. 
I had hardly eaten anything at dinner that day and had sat from early evening at a young engineer's who had two other friends there with him. I sat silent and I think I bored them. They were discussing something controversial and suddenly even grew heated. But I saw that they did not really care one way or the other and had grown heated for nothing. Suddenly I told them as much. But I tell you, you don't care one way or the other, so why bother? They were not offended, and they all laughed at me. This was because I said it without the least censure, and simply because I did not care myself. They saw I did not care, and it amused them. When I thought about the gas in the street, I looked up at the sky. The sky was terribly dark, but you could just distinguish torn clouds with unfathomable black stains between them. Suddenly I noticed a small star in one of these stains, and I began to gaze intently at it. That was because this star put an idea into my head. I resolved to kill myself that night. I had firmly resolved on this course two months before, and poor as I was, I bought an excellent revolver and loaded it the same day. But two months had passed, and it was still lying in a drawer. Such was my indifference that ultimately I wanted to seize a moment when I would be less indifferent. Why, I don't know. In this way, every night during the past two months when I returned home, I thought I would shoot myself. I kept waiting for the moment. And now the star gave me the idea, and I resolved that I would do it that night without fail. Why the star gave me this idea, I don't know. And when I was looking at the sky, the little girl seized me by the elbow. The street was empty, and hardly anyone was about. In the distance, a cabbie slept in his droshki. The girl was about eight, in a kerchief and a thin dress. She was soaked to the skin, but I remember her wet, torn shoes clearest of all, and still remember them. I noticed them especially. She suddenly caught at my elbow and begged me to come. She did not cry, but somehow called out words abruptly which she could not pronounce properly because she was shivering so much with cold. She was aghast at something and called out desperately, Mommy! Mommy! I turned my face towards her, but did not say a word and walked on. Only she ran around me and pulled at my sleeve, and the note which expresses despair in very frightened children rang out in her voice. I know that sound. Though she did not finish what she was trying to say, I understood her mother was dying somewhere, or something had happened to them, and she had run out to fetch someone and find something to help her mother. But I did not follow her. On the contrary, I suddenly felt the urge to drive her away. First I told her to find a policeman, but she clasped her hands and, sobbing breathlessly, ran beside me, refusing to leave me. Then I stamped my foot at her and raised my voice. She just cried out, Sir! Sir! and then suddenly left me and rushed across the road. Someone else was passing by there, and she left me to run to him. I climbed the stairs to the fifth floor. I live with the landlord, and they rent out rooms. My room is poor and small, and the window is a semicircular attic one. I have an oilcloth sofa, a table for my books, two chairs, and a comfortable armchair. It's very ancient, but well sprung. I sat down, lit a candle, and began to think. In the next room behind the partition, a bacchanalia was still going strong. They had begun it the day before yesterday. A retired captain lived there, and he had some guests, about six men of dubious reputation. They were drinking vodka and playing faro with an old pack of cards. The night before, there had been a quarrel, and I know two of them were dragging each other around by the hair for a long while. The landlady wanted to complain, but she is very frightened of the captain. We have only one other lodger in our rooms, a short, thin lady from an army family, not a town-bred person, with three small children who fell ill afterwards in these rooms. Both she and the children are so frightened of the captain that they are ready to faint and spend the night shivering and making the sign of the cross over each other, while the youngest child even had some sort of fit of terror. I know for certain that this same captain sometimes stops passers-by in the Nevsky and begs for alms. No one will give him work, but strangely enough, 
After all, that's why I'm telling this story. During the whole month the captain has spent with us, he never called forth any vexation on my part. Of course, I made no attempts to get acquainted with him from the first, and anyway, he was bored with me at the very beginning. And so, however many of them there were there, I never cared. I sit all night and honestly don't even hear them. I forget them so completely. I haven't fallen asleep until daybreak for the past year. I spend the night in my armchair doing nothing. I only read books during the daytime. I just sit and don't even think. Thoughts wander through my brain and I set them free. The whole candle burns out in the night. I sat down by the table quietly, took out the revolver, and put it in front of me. When I laid it down, I remember I asked myself, All right? And answered myself with complete determination, All right. I meant to shoot myself. That is, I knew I would certainly shoot myself during that night, but I did not know how much longer I would sit by the table until then. And, of course... I would have shot myself if it hadn't been for that little girl. You see, although I no longer cared about anything, yet I still felt pain, for instance. If someone had struck me, I would have felt pain. Exactly the same thing applied in the moral sense. If something very pitiful happened, I felt pity, just as I had felt it before I'd become completely indifferent to life. I had felt pity a few moments back. I would certainly have helped a child. Why had I not helped this little girl then? It was because a thought had occurred to me. When she pulled at my sleeve and begged me to come, a problem suddenly confronted me and I couldn't resolve it. The problem was an idle one, but it angered me. I was angered by the consequent deduction that if I had already made up my mind to make an end that night then I should have become more than ever indifferent to everything which went on in the world. Why, then, did I suddenly feel that I was not indifferent, and that I pitied the little girl? I remember that I was very sorry for her, even to the extent of experiencing a strange, and in my position, even an improbable pain. But I don't know how to explain the transient sensation I experienced then any better. Only the sensation continued when I reached home and sat down, and I felt more irritable than I had done for a very long time. Discussion after discussion flowed through my mind. It was obvious that if I was a man and not a zero, then until I became a zero, I was alive and therefore could suffer, be angry, and feel ashamed of my actions. True, but if I was going to kill myself, say, in two hours' time, then what was this little girl to me, and what business had I to think of shame or anything else in the world? I become a zero, an absolute zero. And surely the knowledge that I would now cease entirely to exist, so that nothing would exist, could not fail to influence however little my feeling of pity for the girl or my feeling of shame at the base thing I had just done. Why, that was my reason for stamping at the poor child and shouting at her wildly, to show that not only did I feel no pity, but also that if I was doing something inhumanly base, then it was permissible, because in two hours' time everything would fade. Can you believe that was why I shouted at her? I am almost certain of it now. I felt clearly that life and the whole world depended on me. You can even put it this way. The world was then made for me alone. Once I had shot myself, the world would cease to exist, for me at least. Not to mention the possibility that perhaps nothing would be left to anyone after I died, and as soon as my consciousness had faded, the whole world would fade as a ghost, as the property of my brain alone, and would become null and void, since, perhaps, I myself am the whole world and am all these people. I remember that as I sat there discussing these things with myself, I turned all these new problems, which crowded forward one after the other, in quite a different direction and invented something fresh. For instance, I suddenly had this strange idea. If I had formerly lived in the moon or on Mars, and had there done the most shameful and dishonest action one can imagine, and had been held up to scorn and ignominy there in a way one can only sometimes experience in dreams, in nightmares, and if afterwards I found myself on Earth and continued to retain cognizance of what I had done on another planet, 
and yet I knew I could never possibly return there. Then gazing up at the moon from the earth, would I feel indifferent or not? Would I feel that action shameful or not? These problems were idle and pointless, as the revolver was already lying in front of me, and my whole being felt that that would happen for certain. But they angered me, and I raged inside. It was as if I could not die, now that I had not solved a preliminary question. In a word, this little girl saved me because I put off the shot on account of these problems. Meanwhile, things had quieted down at the captain's, too. They had stopped playing cards and were settling down to sleep with a few final grumbles and lazy curses. And it was at this point that I suddenly fell asleep, a thing which had never before happened to me while sitting in the armchair by the table. I fell asleep without noticing it at all myself. Dreams, as everyone knows, are strange phenomena. Some things present themselves with a terrifying clarity with details as minute as those in a jeweler's watch, and one leaps over other details without even noticing, over space and time, for instance. It seems that dreams spring from the desires and not from the intellect, from the heart and not the head. And yet to what heights of cunning my intellect sometimes attained in my dreams. And incidentally, the most unintelligible things happen to my intellect in dreams. For instance, my brother died five years ago. Sometimes I dream of him, he takes part in my affairs, we are absorbed in what we are doing, and yet throughout the dream I know and remember that my brother is dead and buried. How is it, then, that I don't wonder why my brother, though dead, is still at my side, busying himself with my concerns? But enough of this. I entered my dream. Yes, it was then I dreamed my dream of November 3rd. They all taunt me now that it was after all only a dream. But surely it makes no difference whether it was a dream or not if this dream of mine showed me truth. Surely once you recognize truth and see it, you know it is the truth and that no other exists or can exist, whether you sleep or live. Well, dream it was, and that doesn't matter. But I had intended to extinguish this life which you so extol by suicide. Well, my dream, my dream... Oh, my dream revealed to me a new, a lofty, reinvigorated and powerful life. Listen. As I said, I fell asleep without noticing it, and even somehow continuing to turn these matters over in my mind. Suddenly I dreamed I took the revolver and, remaining seated, pointed it at my heart. My heart and not my head, and I had firmly decided beforehand to shoot myself through the head, through the right temple to be precise. I pointed it at my breast and waited a second or two, while the candle, the table and the walls suddenly moved and swayed. I hurriedly pulled the trigger. In dreams you can fall from a height, or someone can cut you or hit you, but you never feel pain, except when you really hurt yourself somehow in bed then you do feel pain and nearly always awaken. It was so in this dream of mine. I felt no pain, but it seemed to me that after the shot everything was shaken inside me and everything suddenly faded and it grew very dark around me. I seemed to go blind and mute and to be lying on something hard flat on my back, seeing nothing and unable to make the slightest movement. People moved around me, calling and shouting, the captain in his bass voice, the landlady screaming, and then suddenly there was another interval and I was being carried in a closed coffin. I felt the coffin swaying and reflected on this, and suddenly I was astonished for the first time by the idea that I was dead, quite dead, that I knew this and had no doubt about it, that I could not see or move and yet that I could feel and think. But I soon became reconciled to this and accepted the fact unquestioningly, as usually happens in dreams. And then they buried me in the earth. They all went away and I was left alone, absolutely alone. I made no movement. When I had imagined formerly what it would be like when they buried me in my grave, I really only associated feelings of dampness and cold with the grave. And now, too, I felt I was very cold particularly in the tips of my toes, but nothing else. 
I lay there strangely enough without waiting for anything, accepting unquestioningly the fact that the dead have nothing for which to wait. But it was damp. I don't know how much time passed, an hour, or several days, or many days. Then suddenly a drop of water which had soaked through the lid of the coffin fell on my closed left eye, and in a minute it was followed by a second one, and in another minute by a third, and so on and so on, each after an interval of one minute. A deep indignation suddenly flared up in my heart, and suddenly I felt a physical pain in it. That's my wound, I thought. That's where I shot myself. The bullet is there. And the drop of water continued falling minute by minute on my closed eye. And suddenly I called out, not with my voice, for I was physically helpless, but with my whole being, upon the power and control of everything which was happening to me. Whosoever you are, if you exist, and if anything more intelligent exists than what is now happening here, allow it to be in this place too. If you are taking vengeance on me for my unintelligent suicide, the indecency and absurdity of another existence, know then that no torture that could ever befall me can compare with the contempt which I will silently experience if necessary for millions of years of torture. I called out and then was silent. The deep silence continued for almost a minute and another drop fell but I was boundlessly and infallibly certain and believed that everything would immediately be changed. And so then my grave suddenly opened. That is, I don't know whether it was opened and dug up, but I was taken up by some dark being unknown to me, and we were in space. Suddenly I could see. We were in the depths of the night, and such darkness I'd never seen before. We swept on through space and were now far away from the earth. I did not question the being who carried me along about anything. I waited proudly. I told myself I was not afraid and grew still with delight at the thought that I was not afraid. I don't remember how long we passed on and I can't imagine the time. Everything happened as it always happens in dreams, when one leaps over space and time and the boundaries of existence and of the mind, stopping only at points about which the heart muses. I remember I suddenly saw a small star in the distance. Is that serious? I asked suddenly, unable to contain myself, for I did not wish to ask any questions. No, that is the star you saw between the clouds when you were returning home, answered the being who was bearing me away. I knew it possessed a form resembling the human, but strangely enough I did not like this being. I even felt a deep revulsion. I had experienced complete non-existence, and so had shot myself through the heart. And now I found myself in the arms of a creature who, though not human, still was and existed. Ah, so there is life beyond the grave, I thought with the peculiar carelessness of the dream world. And if I must exist again, I thought, and live again by the desire of some unalterable will, I do not want to be conquered and subjected. You know I fear you, and therefore you despise me, I suddenly told my companion, unable to refrain from making the humbling question which contained the admission, and experiencing this humiliation in my heart like a pinprick. He did not answer my question, but I suddenly felt that I was not despised, and that I was not being laughed at, that I was not even being pitied, and that our journey had a goal, an unknown, mysterious goal which concerned me alone. Fear increased in my heart. Something mute but tinged with suffering communicated itself to me from my silent companion and pierced me. We sped through dark, unfathomable spaces. I had long ceased to see the constellations to which my eyes were accustomed. I knew there are stars in the heavenly regions whose rays reach the earth only after thousands and millions of years. Perhaps we had passed those spaces. I waited for something to happen in a terrible, heart-destroying depression. And suddenly a well-known and extremely powerful feeling shook me. I suddenly saw our sun. I knew this could not be our sun, giving life to our earth, and that we were separated from our sun by a boundless space. 
but for some reason I knew in my whole being that it was exactly the same kind of sun as ours. It's double. A sweet evocative feeling rang out delightedly in my soul. The native power of light, the same which had given me birth, found an echo in my heart and resurrected it, and I experienced life, the former life, for the first time after my grave. But if this is the sun, if this is exactly the same sun as ours, I cried, then where is the earth? And my companion pointed to a star sparkling in the darkness with an emerald sheen. We were speeding toward it. Can such duplicates be possible in the universe? Can this be the law of nature? And if that is the earth over there, can it be like our earth? Exactly like? Unfortunate, poor, but dear, and always beloved, giving rise to the same tormenting love of itself even in the most ungrateful of its children, as does ours? I cried, shaken by an uncontrollable ecstatic love for that former earth which I had abandoned. The image of the poor girl I had hurt flashed through my mind. You shall see everything, my companion answered, and a kind of sadness sounded in his words. But we were fast approaching the planet. It grew under my eyes. I could already distinguish the ocean and the contours of Europe, when suddenly a strange feeling of a kind of lofty and holy jealousy burst into my heart. How can such a copy exist, and to what end? I love and can only love the earth I left, the earth on which my blood has remained, when in my ingratitude I shot myself through the heart and extinguished my life. But I never, never ceased to love that earth, and on the night during which I parted from it I probably loved it more tormentingly than ever before. Does suffering exist on this new earth? On our earth we can only love sincerely with suffering and through suffering. We do not know how to love any other way and know no other love. I want to suffer so that I can love. I desire, I thirst in this moment to kiss, weeping tears, that very earth which I left, and I do not desire or accept life on any other. But my companion had already left me. I had suddenly set foot on that other earth, without having noticed it, and stood in the bright light of a sunny day, beautiful as paradise. I think I was standing on one of those islands which in our world constitute the Greek archipelago, or somewhere on the sea coast of the continent opposite the archipelago. Oh, everything was exactly as it is with us, but it seemed as if everything shone festively and had the air of great holiness, of ceremonial splendor. A gentle emerald sea plashed softly on the shores and caressed them with a love which was apparent, visible, and almost tangible. Beautiful tall trees stood in the full splendor of their hues, and I was convinced that their numberless leaves welcomed me with their quiet gentle noise and seemed to mouth loving words. Flocks of birds crossed in the air, and they did not fear me, but perched on my shoulders and hands, joyously beating their gentle fluttering wings. And at last I saw and recognized the inhabitants of this happy land. They came to me, they surrounded me, and kissed me. Children of the sun, children of their own sun. Oh, how beautiful they were. I had never seen such beauty in man on our earth. Only in our children, in their very first years, could you find a distinct, though faint, reflection of this beauty. The eyes of these people sparkled with a clear light, their faces shone with intelligence and a kind of calm, relaxed consciousness. But these faces were full of laughter. A childlike joy sounded in the words and voices of these people. Oh, I understood everything, everything in my first glance at these people. This was a world untainted by sin. People who had never transgressed dwelt in it, dwelt in a paradise like the one which, according to the legend of all humanity, our own sinful forefathers had inhabited, with this difference only, that here the whole world was paradise throughout its length and breadth. These people, laughing joyously, crowded about me and caressed me. They led me away with them, and each one wanted to console me. Only they did not question me about anything, but it seemed to me that they all knew already and wanted to banish the suffering swiftly from my face. You see how it was, what then, if it was only a dream? The sensation of the love of these innocent and beautiful people has remained with me forever, and I feel that their love overflows upon me from that world. 
I myself saw them, grew to know them, became convinced by them, loved them, and afterwards suffered for their sakes. Oh, I understood at once, even there, that in many ways I could not understand them. As a Russian liberal of our time, an abominable Petersburger, I could not fathom why, for instance, knowing as much as they did, they lacked our learning. But I soon understood that their knowledge was increased and nourished by quite different perceptions from ours, and that their aspirations were also quite different. They had no desire for anything and were calm. They did not aspire to knowledge of life as we aspire to know it, because their life itself was a fulfillment. But their knowledge was deeper and higher than our learning, for our learning seeks to explain what life is and aspires to know it in order to teach others how to live, while they knew how to live without being taught, and I understood this, only I could not comprehend their knowledge. They pointed to their trees, and I could understand the extent of the love with which they gazed upon them, for it was as if they were speaking to beings like themselves. And you know, I may not be wrong when I say that they communicated with their trees. Yes, they had discovered their language, and I am certain they understood each other. They looked at all nature in this way, at the animals who lived peacefully with them without attacking them, and loving them conquered by their own love. They pointed out the stars to me and spoke to me of something about them which I could not understand, but I am certain that they somehow communicated with the heavenly bodies, not only mentally, but in some actual physical way. Only these people did not try to make me understand them. They loved me without that, but I knew that because of this they would never understand me, and so I spoke very little to them about my world. I only kissed the earth on which they lived in their presence and adored them without words, and they saw this and allowed it without shame because they loved everything. They did not suffer for me when, shedding tears, I kissed their feet, they knew joyfully in their hearts with what powerful love they would respond. Sometimes I asked myself in amazement how they could all this time refrain from reviling one like me and never once rouse feelings of jealousy and envy in me. I often asked myself how a boaster and liar like myself could refrain from telling them the things I knew, about which, of course, they had no idea, and merely because I did not want to surprise them with these, or perhaps simply because I loved them, they were playful and joyful as children. They wandered through their beautiful meadows and woods. They sang their beautiful songs. They ate light food, the fruit of their trees, the honey of their forests, and the milk of the beasts which loved them and lived with them. They worked for food and clothing only for very short periods and always lightly. They loved and bore children, but I never saw amongst them the outbursts of that malignant sensuality which attacks almost everyone in our world, everyone and every kind of person, and serves as one of the mainsprings of almost all the sins of our humanity. They had no quarrels or jealousies, and they did not even understand what these were. Their children were everyone's children, because they were all one family. They had hardly any illnesses, although they knew death, but their old people died quietly as though they were falling asleep, surrounded by the farewells of those around them, blessing them and answering the smiles with which the others sent them on their way. I saw no sorrow and no tears on these occasions, but a love which had grown to ecstasy, only to a calm ecstasy, one of fulfillment and meditation. One might think that they kept contact with their dead after death, and that death did not interrupt their earthly union. They hardly understood me when I asked them about immortality, but they were clearly so unconsciously convinced of it that it did not present itself as a problem to them. They had no temples, but they had a diurnal union, vital and uninterrupted, with the whole of the universe. They had no faith, but instead a firm conviction that when their earthly happiness would be complete at the final fulfillment of earthly nature, then they, the living and the dead, would attain a further and wider contact with the whole of the universe. They awaited that moment with joy, but without hurry, without longing, and as if they already held it in those premonitions of their hearts about which they told each other. They wondered lovingly at each other, not only in their songs, but in their whole lives. They had a kind of love of each other, of everyone, which was all-inclusive and integral. 
Most of their ceremonial and sacred songs I could not even understand. I understood the words, but could never perceive all their meanings. It remained unapproachable to my intellect, but my heart attained to it unconsciously more and more. I often told them that I had felt a premonition of this long before, that echoes of all this joy and glory had come to me in our world, calling forth a sorrow which reached to unbearable grief, that I had had a premonition of them and of their glory in the dreams of my heart and the thoughts of my mind, that often I could not look at the sunset in our world without tears. That sorrow always entered my hatred of men in our world. Why could I not hate them without loving them? Why could I not help forgiving them and my love for them contain sorrow? Why could I not love them without hating them? They listened and I could see that they could not imagine what I told them, but I was not sorry that I spoke to them of this. I knew they understood the full force of my sorrow for those I had abandoned. Yes, when they looked at me with a gentle gaze pierced with love, when I felt that in their presence my heart became as innocent and sincere as theirs, I was not sorry that I did not understand them. The perception of the fullness of life took hold of my spirit and I prayed silently for them. Oh, people on this earth all laugh in my face now and assure me that even in a dream you can't see such details as I now relate, that in my dream I saw or felt only one sensation which my heart called up in delirium and the details I invented afterwards. And when I told them that perhaps that's how it really was, Good heavens, how they laughed at me and what merriment I caused them. Oh yes, of course I was only convinced by the sensation of the dream and it only ripened in a heart wounded to bleeding. But in spite of this, the actual images and forms of my dream, that is, those which I really saw during the period of my dream vision, reached such a harmony, were so enrapturing and beautiful and so true, that of course on wakening I was not able to fit them into our feeble words so that they had, so to speak, to seethe in my mind, and so indeed I might have felt the need afterwards unconsciously of inventing details and twisting them in a particular way in response to my passionate desire for somehow conveying them to others. But how could they refuse to believe that all this had existed, since it was all probably a thousand times better, lighter, and more joyous than my description? Dream though it was, yet all this must have existed. You know, I will tell you secretly that all this was very likely not a dream, since what happened was so terrifyingly true that it could not merely be the figment of a dream. Say the dream gave new life to my heart, how then could my heart have the power to give life to the terrifying truth which afterwards befell me? How could I have invented it alone or my heart have seen it in delirium? How could my insignificant heart and my capricious, worthless mind reach the height of such a revelation of truth? Judge for yourselves. Until now I have kept this back, but now I will tell of that other truth also. The fact was that I... ruined them all. <laughs> yes, yes, in the end, I ruined them all. How that could have happened, I don't know, but I remember it clearly. The dream flew over thousands of years and merely left me with the sensation of completeness. I only knew that I was the cause of their falling into sin. I infected with my presence a land that had been happy and innocent before my coming, like an evil virus, like an atom of plague which destroys whole kingdoms. They learned to lie, and to love lying, and to recognize its beauty. Oh, it may have been that this started innocently, in jokes, from coquetry, in the games of love, from an atom. But this atom pierced through to their hearts, and they liked it. <laughs> then sensuality arose, and sensuality begat jealousy, jealousy, cruelty. Oh, I don't know, I don't remember, but soon, very soon, the first blood was shed. But they were amazed and appalled, and they began to separate and fall apart from each other. Societies began to appear, but they were banded against each other. Reproaches and accusations began. They came to know shame and made shame a virtue. 
The idea of honor was evolved, and each society had its own standard. They began to torture the animals, which went away into the forests and became their foes. <laughs> Conflicts began about property, partitioning, individualization, about yours and mine. They began to speak different languages. They came to know suffering and to love it. They thirsted for suffering and said that truth is only attained through suffering. And at that point they discovered science. When they became evil, they began to talk of brotherhood and humanity and to understand these conceptions for the first time. When they became criminal, they invented justice and compiled whole legal codes for its preservation and set up the guillotine to enforce those codes. They barely remembered what they had lost and did not even want to believe that they had once been innocent and happy. They even laughed at the possibility of their former happy state and called it just a dream. They could not even imagine it in forms and images. But strangely and wonderfully enough, when they had lost all faith in past happiness and called it mere myth, they were filled with such desire to become innocent and happy again that they fell before their heart's desire like children, deified this desire, built temples, and began to worship their own idea, their own desire, at the same time being fully convinced of the impossibility of realizing it, yet admiring it with tears and bowing down to it. And if it could have been possible for them to return to that happy state which they had forfeited, and if someone had suddenly shown it to them again and asked them whether they wished to return to that, they would probably have refused. They answered me, what if we are lying, evil and unjust? We know this and we weep for our sins. We torment ourselves, perhaps more than our merciful judge, who shall come to judge us and whose name we do not know. But we have science, and by its aid we shall discover truth once more, but this time we shall accept it consciously. Intellect is higher than feeling. A knowledge of life is higher than life. Science will give us wisdom. Wisdom will discover laws, and the knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness itself. This is what they said, and after such words each one came to love himself best, and they could not do otherwise. Each man became so jealous for his own individuality that he tried with all his might to lower and diminish it in others, and each devoted his life to this. Slavery came, and even voluntary slavery the weak were willing to submit to the strongest on condition that those would help them to crush others even weaker than they. Godly men appeared who approached this people with tears and told them of their pride, their loss of moderation and harmony, and their shamelessness. They were laughed to scorn or stoned. Holy blood was shed at the temple doors. But gradually men appeared who began to invent ways by which they could all be united again without each man ceasing to love himself best and yet not interfering with others, so that they could thus all live together in a harmonious society. Whole wars arose from this idea. At the same time, all the protagonists were firmly convinced that science, wisdom, and a sense of self-preservation would ultimately force man to unite in a harmonious and rational, reasonable society. Therefore, in the meantime, to hasten this cause, the wise ones tried to exterminate those they saw as foolish, who could not understand their idea, in order to prevent them from hindering its triumph. Arrogant men and sensualists appeared who demanded all or nothing. Crime came to the aid of greed, and if crime failed, suicide followed. Religions appeared with the cult of annihilation and self-destruction for the sake of eternal consolation through non-existence and nothingness. At last this people grew weary in their senseless toil, and suffering appeared on their faces, and this people proclaimed suffering beautiful, since thought lies in suffering alone. They exalted suffering in their songs. I went among them wringing my hands and shed tears for them, but I loved them perhaps more than before, when there was yet no suffering in their faces, and they were so innocent and beautiful. I came to love the earth they had profaned even more than I had loved it when it was a paradise, merely because sorrow had come upon it. Alas, I always loved sorrow and suffering, but only for myself, for my own self. For them I wept, pitying them. 
I stretched out my hands to them, desperately blaming myself, cursing and despising myself. I told them that I was the cause of all this, I alone. <laughs> that it was I who had brought corruption, disease, and deceit into their midst. I implored them to crucify me, and I taught them how to make a cross. I could not, I did not have the strength to kill myself, but I wanted to accept torture at their hands. I longed for torture, longed to have my blood spilt to the last drop in these tortures. But they only laughed at me and finally took me for a fool. They acquitted me, telling me that they had only got what they had themselves desired, and that everything which had come about had to come about. It was inevitable. Finally, they told me I was endangering them and that they would put me in a lunatic asylum if I was not silent. <laughs> then grief pierced my heart so powerfully that my heart contracted, and I felt that I should die. <laughs> and... <laughs> well... And then I woke up. It was morning, that is, it was not yet light, but it was getting on towards six o'clock. I woke up in the same armchair. My candle had burnt itself out. They were all asleep at the captain's place, and a rare silence reigned in our flat. First, I jumped up in extreme amazement. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, even to the smallest details. For instance, I had never fallen asleep in my armchair before. Here, while I was standing and coming to myself, my revolver suddenly caught my eye, ready loaded. But I pushed it away from me instantly. Oh, now for life! Life! I raised my arms and invoked eternal truth. Not invoked, but wept. Ecstasy, a boundless ecstasy, inspired my whole being. Yes, life and, and preaching. I decided to preach that moment, and of course for the rest of my life. I go to preach. I wish to preach... What? Truth. Since I have seen it, and seen it with my own eyes, seen it in all its glory. And so from that time I have preached. Moreover, I love those who laugh at me even more than all others. Why this is, I don't know and can't explain, but let it remain so. They say that I am already muddled. That is, if I am muddled now, if I am crazy now, what will happen next? It is absolutely true, I am muddled, and perhaps it will be worse later on. I am bound to make mistakes several times until I discover how to preach, that is, in what words and by what actions, because it is very difficult to accomplish. I can see that as clear as day now, but listen, who does not make mistakes? And incidentally, everyone from the philosopher to the brigand goes toward the same goal, only by different routes. That is an old truth, but this at least is new. I can't be wrong, because I have seen the truth, I have seen it, and I know that people can be beautiful and happy without losing the power to live on earth. I do not wish to believe, and I cannot believe, that evil is the normal state of humanity, and it is only at this belief of mine that they laugh. But how can I help believing? I have seen the truth, not imagined it in my mind, but I have seen it, seen it and the living image has taken possession of my soul forever. I have seen it in such complete perfection that I cannot believe it may not exist among men. And so how can I go wrong? I will take wrong turns, of course, several times even, and will speak in strange alien words, perhaps, but not for long. The living image of what I have seen will always remain with me and will always correct me and set me right. Oh, I am bold and fresh and will go on and on for a thousand years if need be. You know, I wanted to conceal the fact that I ruined them, but that was a mistake, the first mistake. But truth whispered to me that I was lying and preserved me and set me right. But I do not know how to establish paradise because I cannot convey it in words. After my dream, I lost the words, at least all the important and essential words. But let that be. I will go forward and speak unceasingly because I was an eyewitness, even if I do not know how to describe what I saw. And the people who laugh at me cannot understand this. 
He just saw a dream, a vision in delirium, hallucinations. Ah, is there any wisdom in that? And they are so arrogant. A dream? What is a dream? Is our life not a dream? I will say more. Let it be so, even if paradise cannot ever come or exist. After all, I can understand that. I will still preach. Yet how simple it is. In a single day, a single hour, it could all be arranged. The important thing is to love others as yourself. That is the important thing, and that is all. Nothing more is necessary. As soon as you discover that, everything will be arranged. And that is, after all, only an ancient truth which men have read and repeated a million times, yet have not become accustomed to. A knowledge of life is higher than life, a knowledge of the laws of happiness higher than happiness. That is what we must contend against. And I will. If only everyone wishes it, it will immediately happen. I have sought out that little girl, and I will keep doing so. Hi, this is Scott Dewey, reading Fyodor Dostoevsky's Dream of a Ridiculous Man. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it.